when I first gave my life to the Lord, I couldn't wait to tell people about Jesus. I was extremely vocal. Now, of course, I'm high extrovert. I'm a high social guy. I love people deeply, and I wanted everybody to know what I had experienced. Everybody. Now, the people that tried to talk with me about Jesus prior to me giving my life to the Lord, for the most part, I really didn't want to hear what they had to say because I thought I was good. I thought I was spiritual, and I talked a lot about that last week. But once I finally gave my life to the Lord, and I was so radically changed by the Father's love, I could not wait to tell people about how good he was and what he did for my life. And I found myself on college campuses with a YWAM ministry doing evangelism out in front of the, the cafeterias and the libraries, leading people to Christ weekly. I would go out to Miami Beach and do evangelism outreaches. I would go to Florida, uh, um, Florida International University in Miami, and I would do outreach there. I loved leading people to Christ, and I loved preaching the gospel. And I would say to you that 33 years later, that hasn't changed. I am a high evangelist by nature. It's easy for me to talk to people about Jesus, waiters, waitresses, and not be weird about it, just normal, getting to know people, loving them. I loved going out to places where there was big festivals. We would go to big festivals in Coconut Grove in Miami, and we would do outreaches. And of course, we would get rejected a lot. There's a lot of people that would laugh at me, mock me, scoff me, but the, scoff at me. But the more that I went out and did it, the more empowered I became by God to do it. And there were many times that I didn't want to do it, but the minute that I opened up my mouth, there was like this power that would come on my life that was not, that I didn't sense. It was always there, but it was like another measure of grace to do it when I opened my mouth. You know, a lot of times you're going to be more empowered when you choose to do something when you didn't feel like doing it, or it wasn't the right time, or it's like, you know, you don't want to go talk to somebody because you've got your own issues, but see, the Lord works through you mightily when you're obedient despite those own issues that are in your life. And I'm not saying to be fake about it or be a hypocrite. What I am saying is we, uh, so many people have this mindset that once you get to a certain place, then you'll do it. And that's like cleaning yourself up with a hot rag before you jump in the shower. You have to just jump in dirty. And a lot of times, you just have to be willing and obedient. You know, when you give your life to Christ, day one, all those old issues from your past are still there. The Lord goes into this process of cleaning you and transforming you from the inside out over the course of time. It's not like this instant, I mean, you're changed on the inside, but now it's the process of transformation over a lifetime. So you learn to work through those issues. You learn to let go of those things from your past, slowly but surely. You learn the process of admonition and conviction and God dealing with your heart over the course of time. So you can't expect somebody that right when they give their, li their life to Christ that everything's done. And you know my story. For a year, I was, I was a huge proponent of the legalization of marijuana. So for a year, I was spirit-filled, born again, tongue-talking, smoking doobies. And I would, I would get high as a kite and some days storm the gates of hell. And then other days I'd be hiding under the table with conviction, right? And finally the conviction won out because I was like, I don't like this. It was a sober mindedness issue for me and the Lord wasn't okay with it. But the point was, thank God I didn't have weird religious Christians preaching at me during that first year, trying to clean me up in their own strength instead of letting the Holy Spirit do the work in my life. Some of, the, some of the worst things are religious Christians because they get in the way of the process that God has for people. So love people when they come here tatted up, messed up, out of gangs, out of prison. These people are coming in with a lot of issues. Your job is to love them. Your job's to catch them. Let the Lord do the cleaning, amen? So I have always had this urgency, but I want to say to you, there's an urgency more than ever now. I'm feeling this incredible urgency from the Lord, and I will say to you, even though we saw some incredible victories in this election, I believe the work's just beginning. And what we have to do now is not sit back. We need to be more aggressive, but more aggressive for what? What are we needing to be more aggressive for? The gospel and the kingdom. The king, everything was about the kingdom advancing on earth as it is in heaven. 
and God uses his people. It's not some mystical fog. You remember? I remember a movie in the 80s called The Fog. I was terrified of that movie when I was a kid. I also remember a movie called The Blob. Remember The Blob? So the kingdom of God's not advancing through fogs and blobs. It's advancing through people. So, so we are the hands and feet on earth as it is in heaven. So as Christ followers, we have, I want to create this urgency in you. So track with me because I don't have that much time, but I'm going to lay it out for you. And then I'm going to use it to set up what I'm going to talk about next week. All right. As Christ followers, we have a promise of his return. Does everybody know that? We, we have this promise that Jesus is coming back. He's not going to leave us. We're not destitute. We're not hopeless. There's this promise that Jesus is coming back. However, so many people actually, I believe, think very little about it. It's like we know he's coming back, but it's not on our radar screen. Or so many people just don't understand the importance of this end time event that's coming. In fact, many people will come on the scene saying that it's actually not important or that it won't happen. And I want to tell you, the return of Christ is of uttermost importance to me. And that return produces something in my heart to get me up to do what I'm doing today and all the other things that I do outside of these services. Because this service is a small microcosm of the multiple faceted things that happen at Rock City Church. I mean, there's a lot that goes on. And it's a life of sacrifice. But why? Why? We live a life of sacrifice because there's an urgency of what's coming. And it's not out of fear that I do it. It's because I love people. And I don't want those people to perish or not experience the life that's available to them now. So let's look at 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3 and 4. Above all, above all, I love this. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, let me just tell you, I am 100% confident we're in the last days. Now, the last days could be generations, but we are clearly in the last days. Scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. And here's what they're going to say. Where is this coming, as he promised? Because ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it, is, as it has since the beginning of creation. So scoffers in the last days, I'm going to paraphrase you, are saying this. Why hasn't he come? And where's his coming? Nothing's changing. In fact, things are getting worse. Look at the destruction, the division, the disunity, the moral degradation of our society, the polarization of our nation. Why the delay and what's he waiting for? If there was a God, then why would he allow fill in the blank? We all have a question about things that is happening that I just wish God would put an end to it. I'd say at the top of the list for me are pedophiles and suffering to children, right? You know what a scoffer is? A scoffer is somebody that makes fun or mocks someone or something, and in particular, A scoffer applies to those that hold true and dear to their religious values and their faith and their belief system in God. A scoffer is somebody that mocks. And let me just tell you, they are everywhere outside these doors. And some of you may have come in and you have been that person in the past. Maybe you've seen dysfunctional religion, dysfunctional pastors, dysfunctional churches, and you've been on the edge for a long time. Maybe you've been out. This church reaches a lot of people that were church hurt rejected church for a long time, and then came here and said, wow, I didn't realize it could be like that. Because for one, you all should know, I don't like religious spirits, but people bring religious spirits with them. A religious spirit is somebody that's pretentious, fake, not authentic, not genuine, or they're hiding behind the mask of religion. But what you have to understand is a lot of people don't know better. So while you're mad and mocking them, that's all they were ever taught. Why don't you love them and teach them what normal looks like and be patient with them? I don't like people that talk weird Christianese language and it's like, just be normal for a minute. Or I don't want to hear your rap sheet of how great you were in ministry. I want to know you. Sit down for 90 days or a year and get healthy, right? But you have to love those people in the course of time because they're all going to come in here. 
And many of us were once that person. You wouldn't have liked me after I gave my life to Jesus. Because even though I was preaching a lot and I was on fire, I was very religious, but I didn't know any better. It's what I was being taught by religious churches. I had found my value in what I did, not who I was. Let's say this together. I'm not what I do. I do what I am. That's right. So my value was in me preaching or was in me uh, ministering or whatever it was, my personality instead of who I was. So scoffers in particular can be false teachers who like to make their voice heard loudly against the truth while appearing to actually preach and speak the truth. And there's a lot of these guys out there. This is why you have to know the word. This is why you must know proper, healthy doctrine. It's also why you must be in relationship with people so that if you get sideways, you have accountability and they go, hey, that's, that's not kingdom. It's not to front you out or expose you or tear you down. It's to bring life. That's what family does, especially fathers. Fathers are restrainers. So we have to teach people what healthy and normal looks like. Peter goes on to write how these people, these scoffers, forget the power of God's word and how it created and sustained all creation until this day. So Peter says, don't you understand that God's word's upholding everything? So your scoffing is return, yet since the creation of time, God's word has been upholding everything. This is his response. And how just as the earth was once destroyed by water, there is a reservation coming. The earth, the heavens and the earth are reserved for another thing, another coming destruction. And this time it's not by water, but by fire. Now, you guys know I'm not a hell, fire, and brimstone preacher. That's not my nature. But I would be amiss to not teach you this because it creates an urgency of what we're supposed to be doing now. You should be a hundred times more aggressive to advance the gospel. This is an outreach-oriented church. We're not a kumbaya, just pray, Lord, don't pass me by, Lord, it's while we huddle in a circle. There's a lot of hurting, broken people out there. A lot of hurting and broken people. And so, Peter makes this clear. God's word upholds it. There was a destruction then, and a destruction's coming. And this new destruction is, has a name. It has a name. It's called, 2 Peter 3, 7, it's called a day of judgment and destruction for the ungodly. So there is a day of judgment right here written in the word. So there's this reservation that's coming. Next week, I'm going to talk about another reservation that God wants to make and has for you to come to a wedding banquet. So there's this dynamic of a two reservations. Ooh, I got chills talking about it. There's a reservation of a day of judgment, and there's a reservation to a dinner, to the table, to a great wedding feast. So while there's this one reservation going on of a day of judgment and destruction by fire, I want you to come to a different one. Don't go to that reservation. That's reserved for the ungodly, but that's not going to be you. So in these days, there's an urgency because there's this day of destruction and fire that's coming. We're in the last days, however, one day the, with the Lord, because you might be like, well, when's that going to happen? Jesus, remember what I told you last week? Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons, but be witnesses with power until that day comes. Amen. We're in the last days, however, one day the Lord, one day with the Lord is like a thousand years or a thousand years like a day. You know, you know how many days a thousand days is? It's 2.7 years. So the Lord is like, it's just like this. It goes so fast. It goes so fast. And before you know it, it's going to be here. We're to be watching, looking, and praying until the day of his return. This is why the enemy wants to get you dumbed down, sleepy, disengaged, dull of hearing, distracted with the things of this world. Don't get distracted. This is why we fast. This is why we pray. This is why we worship. This is why we have ministry schools. This is why we do all the things that we do, to keep us alert and vigilant until the day of his return. Do you know that the term watch is used 24 times in the New Testament? 
24 times we're told to watch. Mark 13, 33, this is Jesus speaking. He says, take heed, watch, and pray, for you do not know when the time is. So our job is to be taking heed. It means be diligent and pay attention at all times. And so there's a reservation for a day of judgment for the ungodly. We don't know when the time is, but we know we have a job to do until that time comes. And so things seem pretty ungodly today, or as the scoffers would say, why the delay? Let's just get it done now, or let's just take it one step further. Christians are living in a delusion of grandeur, and there's no return of Christ. And if there is a God, he's a slacker. In the 80s, that was my term. I called all my friends slackers. You're such a slacker. Or there's no God, so continue on and simply hope for the best. But Peter answers this question in 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord's not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, if I was God, I probably would have already come back or sent my son now because it's so, the things that I have seen seem to be so bad. But if Jesus came back now, in so many ways, it would be a tragedy, especially to the ungodly. Now, I want Jesus to come back. I'm looking and watching for his return. But until that day comes, there's a greater job to do. And I know a lot of lost, broken, hurting people that need Christ and need the good news, and they're waiting, he's waiting on us to bring it to them. So we see that while we wait, watch, and pray, we have this other job to do, and it's to preach the gospel. If he's waiting and we're watching, then the only proper outcome is to preach the gospel. Until all the earth is heard and becomes a witness to the truth that leaves no man without excuse. Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. So it's not so much about the response of the people. It's giving them no excuse to hear. Now, God's given them no excuse by all creation. If you can't see God in creation, you're blind. But still, he says, go preach the gospel so that all the nations will be a witness so that no man is without an excuse. Even if they reject him, and re they're going to. You're going to be rejected. Next week, I'm going to talk to you about all the classes of people that won't go to the wedding feast and why. They're too busy with their land. They're too busy with their business. They just don't want to go. Oh, they got a new wife. Oh, my kids. And I'm all about family, but family comes second after Christ, just so that you know. That's next week. But I'm setting you up for this because there is an incredible urgency of the hour. Hear the clarion call of my voice. We are not opening up a new sanctuary to just be bigger, better, and have more money. This isn't church competition. It isn't about claims to fame. You should know my history at this point. We are out to win, gain, and save the lost and raise, raise up sons and daughters in the kingdom. And there's a lot of ways that God does it. One of my favorite ways is supernatural power, creative signs and wonders and miracles. Come on. Laying hands on the sick, shikarabasa, casting out de demons. I love all that stuff. And it's all for a greater purpose, to win, gain, and save. In fact, the more we watch and pray, the more we live differently. And in turn, the more we preach and the more we, and I talked to y'all last week about all the different ways you can preach. There's a lot of ways that you can preach the gospel. The, the loudest way you preach is how well you love other people. Because if you're a jerk and you're an idiot, sorry, I shouldn't have said that. And it's none of y'all. It's none of y'all. We'll just say it's for someone else that's not here. <laughs> Second service crew, no, no. <laughs> Seriously, why would I like, I mean, people are like, why would I follow your God? You're a, you're a you know what, a donkey. <laughs> so there's this thing that because we know Christ is coming back, 
We don't know when. And next week, I'm going to talk about a reservation because in those days, they didn't have a clock. It was watches of the day. So you know what they did back then? They set an appointment for, they said, hey, there's a reservation coming, but you don't know the time until, you know when you know the time? When the servants went out to call the people. And guess what? This is the time. Servants are going out. Preachers are preaching. The nation's changing. There's a move of God coming to the body of Christ. If we'll all wake up and be aggressive to save, win, and gain the loss, we're going to see a supernatural movement, and it always starts with repentance. The harvest always starts with repentance. Stop focusing on revival. A real revival starts with broken, repentant, weeping people. So, the more... Listen to this. The more that we preach, the more we hasten the day. Everybody say, hasten the day. So some of us are just like, push the button. Like, let's go, Jesus. Come on back now. So I want Jesus to come back. But do you know that you have an ability to bring him back sooner? Because some's like, well, he's just going to say, no, there's, he's waiting. It's like, we're, God, I'm waiting on you. He's like, no, I'm waiting on you. So watch this, 2 Peter 3, 11 through 15, since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, this is a rhetorical question, what holy and godly lives you should live. Oh, man, I love that. So because I know he's coming, remember my story, I'm at the reggae club, I'm born again, I go to, I go to Coconut Grove, Hungry Sailor, it's the name of the bar, I used to play in it, now I'm at it, born again, drinking Coronas. I want to reach my old lost friends, so I went and hung out with them, but the problem was I was putting back Coronas. I was bumping and grinding and dancing, speakers to the ceiling, pumping reggae music, weed wafting through the air, and all of a sudden, I heard a trumpet in the spirit, and I saw, I had a vision of a bright white light coming through the windows, and I was terrified because I said, God, don't come back now. This isn't where I want to be. <laughs> You don't want to be in the club when Jesus comes back. Let me just, you don't want to be smoking, snorting, sleeping, whatever it is when Jesus comes back. Am I right? Because you're going to, you don't want to be caught with your pants down. You want to be ready when he comes. Literally, that's a literal statement. So verse 12 Verse 12, looking forward. Everybody say, looking forward to the day of God. And watch this, hurrying it along. Wait. Yeah, hurrying it along. Hurry it along, folks. Hasten the day. That's what the new King James says. So you sit back and complain and be mad and pit ourselves even more against the, the political parties you don't like because they're manifesting on another level. You don't be prideful. You don't be arrogant. You be grateful and thankful. Our trust is in Jesus the King, not a president. We're thankful for laws in the land that protect life and protect families, and we voted accordingly. But our hope is in another king, another man. His name's Jesus, Amen. right? You understand that? And so, so there are so many people that are destitute and deceived and desperately need Jesus. And so he's saying, hey, until the gospels preach to bring a witness to the nations, I'm not coming. I'm not coming because I don't want anybody to die and perish. Because if I come back now, there are going to be a lot of people. So I think to myself, Lord, how could you be waiting? I mean, I see atrocities that blow my mind and all the mass murders and deaths and children are involved in horrid, 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 horrible things. And I think, how, Lord, how? And he's like, you got a job to do. I'm not coming until you go bring that gospel to some of these people that desperately need it because I don't want your brother, your mother, your sister, your grandparents, your family members, your best, old best friends to die. I want them to come to a place of repentance and be saved. And so many of us are dumbed down by our own pleasures and our, the, our bellies are ruling us. We're not aggressive. We're not on fire. We're not passionate. And this isn't me beating the sheep. I'm just saying in general to the, to the worldwide body of Christ, 
Let's get going because if there was ever an urgency, it's now. Now is not the time to sit back. Now is the time to be more aggressive with supernatural life. So all the elements are going to be melt away, verse 12. We're looking forward, verse 13, to a new heaven, new earth. And I love this in verse 13, a world filled with God's righteousness. How many of us would like to see a world filled with God's righteousness? Now, let me ask you this question. Do you think God wants people to be saved all over the world? Now, what happens when people get born again and born again and born again in other nations? Those nations start to live, act, and love like Christ does. Then rulers get put into place that live, act, and love like Christ does. Now, that may not always happen. I pray that in North Korea, that nation would flip upside down. And you should know that in Iran, North Korea, and um, China, there is a massive expansion of the gospel happening right now. Now, it will have a trickle-up effect over the course of time. But even if it doesn't, it doesn't matter because you're not of this world. Everybody say, I'm not of this world. world. All men, look at what God says. He says, let God be true and every man a liar. Because we all have a a tendency to lie in some way or another. We don't put our trust in any man. We put him in the king. But... God wants all the world filled with righteousness. And people want to put labels and names on you. I've been called a white, racist, fascist. Let me tell you, you're going to call me a racist? I wish I was black most of the time. (laughs) I'm not kidding you. I love the Caribbean. I love soul food. I play percussion. I grew up in Miami. I'm not, I'm serious. I may be white, but don't let the skin color fool you. I'm all black inside. I'm a racist. I'm also Mexican. Have you seen my posse? In fact, you're every nation try you be whatever you you be Chinese if you want. The king lives in you. You're every nation tribe and tongue. Come on. Racist. Everybody wants to put a label. It's like, oh, Christian nationalists. They think Trump is like their savior, and then they're mocking and scoffing, creating pictures of Trump hanging on a cross or with angel wings. And I have made it clear to you that I only vote according to my values, and I put my no, I don't put my hope and trust fully in a man, but I want to pray for them and believe that they'll be instruments of God to bring righteousness to the land. Why not? a good day. It's a good day for our nation. When wickedness pushes back, the righteous rejoice. I'm blowing my whistle in church. We're shouting in church. We're excited, but yet there's this urgency of importance now, and I feel it more than ever before because the natural tendency is to go back to the way or just sit back and and enjoy. No, 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 no. There are more and more people out there that are angry, mad, hurt, blaming Jesus, blaming the church, And it's like, go out there and preach the gospel. And even if they reject you, so what? Be a witness. And let's hasten the day of Christ's return. Verse 14, and so, dear friends, while you're waiting for these things to happen, make every effort, everybody say every effort, to live a peaceful life that's pure and blameless in his sight. And then finally, I'm gonna leave you with this and we're gonna pray. Verse 15, Oh man, do I love this. Verse 15. And remember, our Lord's patience gives people what? And how are they going to get saved? Now, some can have a supernatural dream and vision in the night. It's happening with Muslims all over the world. Places where evangelists can't get to, God's having this way of saving them. But there's there's a lot of broken people and your backyard is your mission field. Now, you can't give what you don't preach. I'm sorry, what you don't live. Remember what I showed you last week, 1 Corinthians 9. I gave you the scripture that those who preach the gospel should, what? Live from the gospel. You can't give what you don't live from. The gospel is good news. 
We've had some incredible news recently, but that's not good news for everybody. There's a better news above and beyond that, and it's the good news of what Christ did for your life. Jesus loves you. There is, this, there is an urgency in this hour. Cut the things out of your life that are holding you back from Christ. If your right hand caused you to sin, cut it off. Whatever you gotta do to live aggressive and on fire, get around people that are aggressive on fire that'll pull you up, that are healthy and normal. Lay hands on the sick, pray for people, step out in faith, even if you feel unqualified or uh, that you have an inability because God gives abilities and, and qualifies those that are not in the natural. It's a supernatural qualification. And when you're born again, Christ comes in you and gives you a new life, a new lease, a new hope. And I'm telling you right now, he's coming back. So let's start inviting people to something better than what's coming. Amen? Let's all stand. Now, God's got something great for every single one of us. He's died on the cross. All of us have the same ability to be saved. All of us have the same ability to walk in the power of Christ. I don't get any special measure because I'm a pastor, right? It's, it's, he's no respecter of persons. Every one of you can hear his voice, be empowered by him. All of you can get healing so you can go bring healing to someone else. And even if you're in that process, which most of us are, tell somebody like, hey, I'm in a process of healing, but let me just tell you how good Jesus is. Let me tell you what Jesus did for me. Your testimony is so powerful. If you knew who I once was and who I am now, those are the types of things you say to people. Or you prophetically show them the goodness of God by how you live, how you love, and how you speak. You can do this. And I'm so fired up by what the Lord's done but I also have this sobering thing that the work's just begun. Does anybody feel that way? Does anybody feel like, okay, it's really go time now. And there's a door of opportunity that's been opened to preach the gospel in the United States of America. Whew, man. Close your eyes for a moment. Lord, I just pray for this church, all the new people that are coming, all the friends, the family, what you're doing. You're not just doing it here, Lord. You're doing it all over the city and all over the world. But thank you, God, for Rock City. I'm gonna pray for a boldness for you and for this church and courage. Some of you need courage. So just receive this. I'm praying for you and this family to be bold and courageous for the king. So Lord, I pray boldness and courage right into the hearts of all the men, the women, the mothers, the fathers, the sons, the daughters, the aunts, uncles, grandparents. I pray a fire of God to come into your heart right now. Just let the Lord touch you deep on the inside. We have a job to do, beloved. I pray a burning passion for the rescue mission to snatch people out from death, destruction, and the widening of the road to the gates of hell. God, I pray such a burning urgency and a, and a diligent focus that we would live our lives different, that we would take care of our temples, that we would be sober-minded, that we would be watching and praying as Jesus instructed us to do. Looking forward to the day and Lord, I know you're waiting on us and you've given us a grace card. You've given us a mercy card. Now God, fuel the fire in our brains and our hearts for this next season to come and what lies ahead. Help us to understand that you don't want anybody to perish. May that be in our hearts as well. I don't want anybody to not know this nor should you. I speak life to you, health to you. If you've wandered away from God this morning, wander right back on in. Just say this prayer with me. Say, Heavenly Father, I'm coming home. I don't want to live the way I was living. How much more should I live according to your design? So much more. Lord, have mercy on my life. Reawaken me. Save me. Heal me. Deliver me. 
set me free and show me the beautiful, wonderful life that I can live with you. Thank you, God, for this church and what's coming. Shikarabasa. We don't have a harvest problem. We have a laborer problem. Put your hand on your heart and say this to me. Say, Lord, make me a laborer. Make me a worker. The harvest is ready, but the laborers are few. So now we're going to pray together for the harvest. Ready? We pray to the Lord of the harvest to raise up laborers and workers to go out to go out and work the field and reap the lost and bring them to the storehouse. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, y'all. Yeah. Woo, get fired up. It's exciting times. I love y'all. Y'all guys have a great day. We'll see you guys next week.